Uh, well, thank you all very much for your presence and attention. What I wanna talk with you in the next half hour is really some initial exploration and analysis we've been doing looking at the use of large language models to support task learning for cognitive agents. Uh, this is work that uh, we're doing at the new uh, Center for Integrated Cognition with my colleagues, James Kirk and John Laird. And we certainly are grateful to the support and sponsorship of the Office of Naval Research uh, for this work. Just wanted to mention in starting that the Center for Integrated Cognition is a new AI nonprofit. We're really focused on tackling basic research that requires multiple reasoning and learning methods and applying them across a variety of domains. So uh, we found, John Laird and I founded it uh, in March and we're just getting started and excited to share this new work that we're doing at the new, this work that we're doing at this new center with you. So I'm starting with a kind of motherhood and apple pie slide, but the reason for that is the feedback from the reviewers, which was a little bit like language models may not be a good use of your time. So I wanted to kind of frame what we're doing by talking about the need for an agent to access information from outside of itself. Uh, for any kind of long lived agent, we would expect that agent to need to access information. We sort of know from our deep reinforcement learning colleagues that experience can be a great teacher, but as um, we heard this morning, right? If the knowledge is out there already, why would I spend time learning it from experience? What shouldn't I just go get it? Um, I really came at this problem originally a couple decades ago, uh, kind of thinking about our, our earlier talk, uh, immediately preceding this one, Jesse's talk, by thinking about how agents could use highly curated sort of bespoke knowledge bases built in ontological languages uh, today that might be basic formal ontology a couple dec decades ago it was more semantic web stuff um, but there's this range of of knowledge sources that an agent could use um, some of the work that has been done at university of michigan by john and james uh, is really looking at how can an agent interact with a human and learn and extract information from that human to perform new tasks as well um, these different sources have different characteristics. And one of the key characteristics that we're interested in thinking about in terms of language models is the breadth of knowledge that they provide. So I mentioned that those uh, ontological knowledge bases uh, are very, uh, they're manually curated and, and highly accessible to an agent, but they also aren't typically very broad in their knowledge. Whereas the internet, uh, or you know, a library of books would have a lot of breadth of knowledge, but then there's an issue of accessibility. And certainly people are, like we heard in the previous talk are working on making that kind of knowledge accessible to an agent. Um, so I wanna ground this a little bit more by talking about uh, a potential application domain. Um, this is not, you know, these images on the, on the left, uh, on the right, excuse me, are, are intended to be a little bit uh, obvious that uh, this is a, a aspirational, kind of work, but it is inspired by the work that's been done on interactive task learning uh, at the University of Michigan using ROSI, which is something that uh, we've kind of been thinking about as a, as a place to start this work. And so imagine that you're, uh, you have a robot and that robot is supposed to work in a variety of, of environments in which it helps a human, a house, a home, an, off, a, 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 an office, a warehouse. And of course the robot would be provided with general task knowledge, but as soon as it got into a specific environment, it would need to start learning new things. So if an office environment, maybe in an office environment, it knows how to tidy up, but it's actually been put into a law office where there's a library and now it needs to know how to tidy up a library, which may not be something that was provided with originally. Um, maybe you come into a household where they make yogurt and so you need to learn how to make yogurt. So those are the kinds of things that uh, a robot or an agent like this would be immediately faced with. Now with today's ITL, uh, an experienced human instructor can probably teach that agent to do these tasks. Um, but one of the challenges is that the current process is pretty tedious and time intensive. So you might have to explain concepts. You might have to connect the, sort of the human interactor is having to connect concepts that the, the agent needs to other concepts that it knows. Another very basic problem is a human instructor may not always be available. So we're thinking about this problem of external knowledge sources in the context of supplementing human instruction, ma making that human instruction more valuable and less tedious and time intensive for the human. And what we're gonna talk about today is really, okay, let's think about language models as that potential source. So uh, what would be the potential of language models as well as what are some of the challenges in using them? 
So we're going to talk about uh, language models a little bit more, but I just want to give you one more example before we get further into this, which is um, during, during COVID, I learned how to make yogurt, which was not something that I ever imagined that I would do, but uh, I regularly make yogurt now. And certainly if I had a household robot, I would ask my robot to, to learn to make yogurt. So I might say, I'm going to teach you to make yogurt tomorrow. And the robot says, I'll prepare. And maybe unbeknownst to me, the robot says, I don't know what yogurt is. So what is yogurt? And it actually turns out if it asks a language model, in this case, it's asking GPT-3 from OpenAI, what is yogurt? It will get a description back of what's yogurt. Um, for now, let's not worry too much about exactly how accurate the responses are, um, how difficult it would be for an agent to interpret these. I'm trying to just give, give a sense of kind of the space of knowledge that might be available. So, okay, I know what yogurt is. What are the steps involved in making yogurt? And I get some information back about that. Do I need any special equipment to make yogurt? And uh, in this case, GP3 says you need a yogurt maker and a thermometer. Now, I don't make my yogurt with a yogurt maker, so I know that there's some inaccuracy here. But again, the point is these language models appear to have uh, information that would be available, uh, uh, to, could, could be useful to the agent if we can make it available. Um, so a little bit more about language models. These are uh, systems that really emerged going back to around 2014 for the first sequence to sequence architecture, but they're deep, deep neural networks uh, that are designed to produce sequences from sequences. Um, they're trained on a large corpora of text and they're really trained in a self-supervised way so that you're essentially, uh, the, the model is attempting to produce uh, sentences that it's seen before, make predictions about the next word based on sentences that it's seen, seen before. Um, they're when I say large, I sort of emphasize large language models here because just in the space of a couple of years, we've gone from millions of parameters to trillions of parameters with uh, Google Switch just came out earlier this year. Um, and one of the reasons there's a lot of excitement about these language models is they perform extremely well on a large range of natural language benchmark tasks. So state-of-the-art class sentiment analysis, language model, state-of-the-art question answering language model. And so this uh, sort of suggests that, that, that uh, um, they could be powerful tools. We were interested in just, well, are they, how, are there, is there potential here and evidence that would suggest are they powerful tools for the purposes of knowledge extraction? Um, and the answer there also is kind of unequivocally yes. There is a lot of work that's been published, especially in the last two years, about various types of knowledge that can be extracted from these language models. There's lots of caveats that would go into that, but, but in terms of potential, there's clearly lots of potential, lots of different kinds of knowledge. And then I mentioned that transition from millions to billions to trillions of parameters. And it turns out that the language models, just by adding essentially more uh, parameters in these models, more layers, they do get uh, more powerful in terms of their overall capabilities. So they're improving very, very quickly because of that, because it's more of a technical problem to get them to improve than a uh, intellectual problem in terms of coming up with new algorithms or something. So what I want to do uh, for the rest of this talk is kind of walk through what we've done in terms of our initial analysis, understanding the requirements for extraction. And particularly, I want to talk about something that I'll call actionable extraction. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, sketching out a general extraction process. That extraction process really is based on the kind of extraction that we've done from interactive task learning and from uh, reaching out to formal knowledge bases like a, a, an ontological knowledge base, and then identifying some core challenges that we'd have to address to realize some of the potential that we talked about in the, those examples that I showed. So what I'm going to do now is really walk through a series of characteristics that these language models have to just kind of get a feel for what the requirement space might look like. And then we'll kind of in the next, uh, ne next part of the talk, talk about more specific requirements. So one of the characteristics of these language models is that we think, uh, we meaning kind of a, a lot of people, not just uh, our group, think that they have a lot of, of knowledge embedded within them that could be exploited. So I mentioned, you know, it knows about GPT-3 knows about yogurt. It also knows about tidying up an office. It also knows about how to escort people in a warehouse. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge available and our intuition is in terms of that sort of uh, picture that I showed before that the language models are gonna have a lot more breadth and available knowledge than most of the knowledge bases that are available today, including, you know, things like OpenPsych. So 
Um, so that's our intuition. Not, uh, you know, we haven't proven that yet, but that's that's part of the real opportunity here is if they really have all of this knowledge available, then can we exploit it and use it? Um, one of the challenges associated with all that breadth and depth of knowledge though, is where did it come from and is it any good? And so uh, whatever knowledge you get out is gonna be conditioned upon what went in. So uh, here's an example. I asked GP3, how long can I leave milk on the counter? And it comes back and says, well, whole milk, you can leave three to five days on the counter. So that's clearly a problem. Uh, Another thing is that the timeliness of the data. So if I ask it, who's the current leader of Canada, it gives me the right answer. But if I ask it, who's the current leader of the UK, it actually does not give me uh, the right answer. It gives me the answer at the time at which it was trained, which then was Theresa May, uh, uh, Prime Minister of the UK. So there's gonna be problems with the uh, accuracy of the knowledge and sort of that will be a key issue as we go through this. Um, another key issue is the relevance of the knowledge. So just like knowledge bases, the language models have no awareness of your context, uh, of the agent's context rather. And so can I leave milk on the counter? Why is it giving me that response to can I leave milk on the counter? Well, there's some probabilistic weights and milk and duration, milk and duration, that's normally how long can I leave it in the fridge? And so that's the answer that I get back, even though that's not the question that I asked. If I very slightly change the question and just say, how long can I leave milk sitting on the counter? I actually get a better answer a more appropriate answer for my, my current context. And so this now becomes a challenge for the agent to know how to construct um, these questions to a language model to essentially be able to, to get this kind of relevant information back. The models are, these language models tend to be also super sensitive. So uh, they don't have knowledge of my context. And here it says warm until it reaches 85 degrees. Now I mentioned that I learned how to make yogurt. So I know that that 85 degrees is a centigrade degrees, um, but that's not explicit here. It turns out if I ask the same question and only change the spelling of yogurt, I get a different result, which in this case gives me uh, degrees Fahrenheit instead of degrees Celsius. So the, the sensitivity issue is gonna be uh, a challenge as well. Um, another important characteristic to point out is that the language models have no situatedness uh, of your of the specific situation. So it can't tell me whether I have a yogurt ma maker or not. If I need new filters for my air conditioning system, it can't tell me anything about that. And this is also true for everything that we've talked about today other than that direct human interaction. But this is also why that wanting to make the direct human action be more about that specific circumstance and let all the other things that need to be learned by the agent come from other sources important because that's where the human interaction can be really important is making it specific to the current situation. Um, even a book has metadata associated with it. If you turn to the front piece, you'll find out who the publisher was. Um, the publisher might give you some sense of the provenance. Language models today, we just don't have that kind of metadata about the language model itself. Part of that's because we just, people haven't actually figured that out yet. It's not just that it's not wholly represented, it's not understood yet. Um, and that's gonna be a challenge for using these because an agent needs to know where it can, one of the questions it's gotta ask is, where do I go to find this information? And the, that, that information about what the language model could provide just isn't available yet. Um, accessibility is also an important characteristic. All the examples that I've showed you so far, the responses have been in the form of something that looked a lot like natural language. Well, if my agent can read natural language, why am I using a language model? So for agents that don't have full natural language capabilities, this notion of matching that the language model being able to match to the agent's capabilities to understand what it's producing is gonna be really important. And the last is this notion of kind of how do I use these language models as an agent, given that they are very large, they have computational demands, there's latencies involved with using them. And so those are uh, potential things that we might have to think about in terms of having these agents use these systems. So given uh, those characteristics, I wanna just kind of uh, come back and, and think about the goal uh, or communicate what the goal is again, which is this notion of what we think about as actionable extraction. So what we're really interested in evaluating is, is to what extent can this extracted knowledge that we get from one of these large language models be used to enable new 
task performance or improve task performance. Um, and for us, actionable does not mean that it needs to be complete, right? So it very much could be that there's a human still involved in this interaction. It could be that there's uh, ontological knowledge bases and, and so forth that could be involved, but it's really, you know, to the extent to which the language model can facilitate that coming online and learning a new task. But there are some important implications from what we just went through. So this challenge of uh, accuracy and relevance and sort of getting information out of the language model that you need is going to be a kind of severe core problem for the agent. Um, and, and, and really, if, we're, if we were successful here, then this seems like it would be highly worthwhile. And if this turns out to be really difficult, it may not be that language models are a great choice. Um, uh, the other challenge is this lack of model knowledge that I mentioned. And so we think and, uh, that what the agent is going to need here is a mod to build a model of what an individual language model is good for, what patterns of use work on various models and so forth. And then in terms of that in inaccessibility problem, do I need to process natural language to be able to use a language model? Um, one of the things we want to look at is the agent directing or having strategies to direct the production of what uh, the language model uh, provides match to its interpretation capability. And I'll show an example of that in a couple minutes. All right, so I, I want to just very, very briefly sketch this idea that we have for, or this uh, design that we have for acquiring agent knowledge from a, a, uh, a language, excuse me, acquiring knowledge from a language model. Um, there's really six steps that I've seen in various work that we've done related to extracting knowledge from knowledge bases. They all seem to apply here. So I've got to sort of identify a need within, the agent identifies a need within itself to go out and find information. It queries the knowledge base to say what, what kind of information is available, gets into, uh, that information back. Oftentimes it needs to sort of put that knowledge into the context of what it's trying to do and test and verify it. If it decides that the knowledge that it got back is good, then it can encode it into its knowledge base and over time continue to apply it and then refine it as, as uh, uh, various uh, as, it, as it needs to. Um, this is a very iterative process. So it's you know laid out here as arrows, but there's lots of going back and forth. And in terms of the challenges and kind of what we see is that a lot of, of a lot of this process is going to be very similar to other kinds of extraction. But all the things in blue here are going to be specific to a language model. And there's a, a number of, of challenges that I want to talk about. So the first is that uh, that I mentioned is querying a knowledge base, uh, uh, you know, formal knowledge base is, is generally pretty straightforward. But the, the prompting strategies here are going to be very important for the agent to, to understand how to do well in order to get back accurate and relevant information so that it's not all noise. Um, a second challenge is how is it going to construct that model of the usage? What goes into that? And then how does it build it over time? Um, it's also going to need to, as I mentioned, somehow guide or constrain the thing that gets back. So interpreting the results that you get back, say, from a formal ontology, as long as you have an, a parser for that language, it's, it's a really straightforward thing but how you're gonna interpret results, uh, how the agent will interpret results from uh, a language model is a much more challenging problem. And then finally, uh, in terms of the core challenges, how do you assess and verify results? And part of the challenge here is gonna be, there's, there's multiple ways in which this problem could, could uh, break down and that the fact that there's multiple ways it could break down is gonna make that test and verification process more uh, complicated. And I just wanted to mention that we don't really talk about this in the paper, but there's also a methodological challenge, which is related to, there's a very large design space here that we're talking about. And so how do we sample that design space in sort of a systematic but meaningful way to essentially explore it sufficiently to understand um, whether or not there's solu you know, effective solutions in this space? Five minutes left. Great. Um, so in terms of potential methods of extraction, I just want to walk through a few of these with examples from things that we are working on now. 
Um, I want to mention uh, as a kind of a, a straw man, most of the process that we're using is, is going to be based on prompting, but there is this other method which is fine tuning for a specific kind of extraction task. Maybe the canonical example there is a system called Comet. And Comet took uh, essentially assertions from a semi curated knowledge base, ConceptNet, Atomic, they've done it in a, a number of different knowledge bases, and then trained some additional layers on top of the language model. And then that allows the language model to essentially produce new assertions. So in this case, uh, I can say taking a shower causes and I, the language model produces being clean. And then that results in a new assertion that I can save into this knowledge base that it didn't previously have. Um, one of the challenges of the fine tuning approach is it's potentially expensive. So this additional training takes time and takes computational resources, but it might be apt for a uh, recurring task that you knew that you were gonna do over and over again. So you could pay that cost once and then amortize it. Um, but we've been really looking at these prompting approaches. I'm going to walk through uh, a few prompting approaches, which is uh, one is using kind of a simpler uh, way of, of accessing information out of the language models and mass language models. Essentially, these are fill in the blank questions. And one of our notions here is that we know a lot about task knowledge and what kinds of things go into task knowledge, the problem space computational model kind of tells us the various components that, that an agent will need to perform a task. And so we can create templates to do that uh, and extract that knowledge. So here's just a few examples. The arrows are pointing to kind of a few of the examples that have this sort of template-based template extraction. And so a robot can mask a package and you get back open, deliver, inspect the package and so forth. So you know, this might be a way to extract very accessible information, on not a lot of cost, no, no additional training involved. Um, context is really important for addressing that relevance problem. And so we know that uh, from work that's been done by others that you can construct, uh, prom when prompts have semantic similarity to the target, you get better results. So in this particular example here, um, if I mention household furniture instead of furniture in GPT-3, I get better results um, than just mentioning furniture in terms of more precise results. So beds and chairs, uh, and wardrobe, uh, beds and wardrobes, for example, instead of just chairs and tables. Um, here's an example, just a very simple of that example of that from the paper where if you say a bay is used for a mask, a, a bay is used for mask, you get back lots of stuff about open bodies of water bays. But if, if I just pref preface that with just the two words warehouse robot, then I get a bay is used for storage and loading. So we get back better results just with that simple, very, very simple kind of contextual addition. Um, uh, the third uh, class of prompting that we're looking at is this notion of analogical prompting, which is just the idea that uh, I can give it examples of the kinds of information that I'm looking for, and then that helps it fill it in. So by saying the household robot charges in the garage and the office robot charges in the maintenance closet, then I get back the warehouse ro robot charges in the storage room, uh, which I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's, it's a potentially realistic response. Um, and then I wanted to just briefly mention, you know, how will we get accessible responses? So in this particular example, what you're seeing on the, on the right side of this example is really by providing some prior dialogue, this is dialogue that Rosie actually parses that uh, interactive task learning uh, agent that I mentioned before, you actually get back responses that are much more sort of in, the, in a form that Rosie, this particular agent can uh, uh, parse. And so the, the real point here is that if I've got lots of dialogues with humans that I know that I can parse, then we might be able to use those to sort of uh, bias the results to something that's more uh, accessible to the agent. So just in summary, you know, the thing that we're interested in is can language models be one of these external knowledge stores that we routinely use in cognitive systems to uh, help agents learn. Uh, we want to kind of think about how effective they can be at that task. There's lots of positive evidence from that, but there's also some costs and some concerns associated with that. So you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's part of the where we are in terms of evaluating this question. And then I just wanted to mention that, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing builds on advancements and understanding within this community that I think has potential to make uh, these language models uh, more practically useful 
in the kinds of uh, interactive, dynamic, open world environments that we're interested in in the cognitive systems space. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it. That's a good timing. Well done. To, uh, and um, we, you got lots of questions. So the first one is from Pat Longley. Would you like to ask it by yourself? Sure, Bob. So I, you certainly should take advantage of, of language models that are out there, but there is one developed by researchers at RPI that I understand has pretty broad coverage. Could you just, and it's something that, that might be a more natural mapping to the, to the things you want, want. So could you, could you talk about what you see as its limitations as compared to the statistical methods you're using? I don't know enough about the specific language model that's been developed at RPI to comment specifically on that. I mean, I think that we are, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know enough about it. So. Well, I see, Je I see Jesse is here. I don't know if, if Marge or, or Sergey are on online. Uh, they, they aren't, but it, yeah, Bob, if you want to um, pick my brain about it at some point, happy to share. Great. Great. Next question is from John Lard. Would you like to ask it yourself? Yeah, I think John was just responding to, to Pat's comment. So, uh, so, so it looks like, you know, Mark asked a question about is yeah. consistency a problem? And consistency is definitely, uh, there's, there's two or three different aspects of consistency, which here we just talked about accuracy is kind of a, a roll up of that, but there's, do I get the same response or uh, I guess also sensitivity, right? Do I get the same response every time, which you can control that because there's parameters associated with a language model so that you can get to the same prompt. You can always get back the same response if you want, although you can get different responses as well. Um, and then there's also the sensitivity issue, which is very small changes, even changes in articles, uh, you know, A versus D can significantly change the results that you get back. Um, so that's why we think that language, that model of use is gonna be really important to kind of start to systematize within the agent how, what, what these sensitivities are and how to handle them. So I was actually thinking a little bit more about, you know, what happens when you ask a question and then you need to ask a follow-up question. Uh, the answer may come back from a completely different space and, and you won't be able to combine those answers to get what you need. This is a problem with the dialogue systems that are online now generally, but uh, it's gonna be true here in space. Okay. Great. Hey, Bob, are, is your new, new nonprofit, is it, uh, is it uh, tax write-off? Can we, can we donate? Uh, I assume you could donate. <laughs> we, nobody's asked us that question, Pat. So, uh, well, that's okay. If anyone is looking for a place to donate, they can always send money to the Cognitive Systems Foundation. Nice job, Pat. <laughs> that's great to know. And the next question is from uh, Forbes. Uh, why do you assume that knowledge base don't contextualize? Many do representation in all incorporate conditions of use, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I don't know whether we're using the word context in quite the same way. So uh, I'm thinking about external knowledge stores about which the agent does not have a prior existing uh, I don't know, relationship, for lack of a better word. And so part of the issue there is that those knowledge bases can't know about my specific circumstances. Uh, um, by that nature. So I, I certainly agree that knowledge bases can be built up within an agent or, you know, an agent could use a knowledge base as an external store that could capture some of that contextual information, but just a priori when I have a new task and I want to reach out to a knowledge base, that knowledge base can't have a priori knowledge of the task that I'm learning. Or I can't, I can't assume that it has, I guess that's really a better way of saying it. <laughs> 